gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today to episode one of It's Me Speaking to You. I am your host, Jeffrey Wilson. The whole premise of It's Me Speaking to You is essentially just having a variety of guests on to discuss a variety of subjects. And today, our first guest kicking things off, you will not be disappointed with. We're rolling with legendary status, folks, today, folks. We are rolling with MMA legend, UFC Hall of Famer, trainer of champions, Tim Sylvia, heavyweight champion, Matt Hughes, welterweight champion, Chance Pulver, lightweight champion, and he himself was the first welterweight champion. And he also trained the very uh, the present UFC welterweight champion, Robbie Lawler. Ladies and gentlemen, we are joined with Mr. Pat Militich. What's up, Pat? How you doing? Thanks for joining us, brother. I'm doing great, Jeff. Thanks for having me, buddy. Man, I appreciate you taking the time and kicking us off here so strong. Um, just in case people might be uh, living in some troglodytic cave coma and don't know what's going on with Pat Militich, what you been up to, man? What you got going on? Uh, you know, right now I'm down in Houston to do a broadcast. I work for Mark Cuban's TV network, Access TV, so I call fights pretty much every Friday night with Michael Chavello and, you know, do, do a few other things, but also on a a uh, law enforcement military training company. I do a lot of that. And I've got three daughters, so that that obviously has been pretty busy all day. Ah, so school started back up, and uh, Peace has re returned to the military home? <laughs> I don't know about Peace. Uh, when all the kids are, all the girls are getting ready to go to school, um, that's always chaos, I can tell you that. Oh, controlled chaos, and I'm sure, I'm sure you deal with it well, sir. I'm sure you deal with it well. So before we get too crazy uh, into some of the little bit more substantive issues, I mean, I guess I would be remiss to have on the UFC Hall of Famer and uh, champion without talking about the UFC a little bit, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, no problem. Of, yeah, a little bit of the product now, man. I'm a big fan of Ronda Rousey. I am not, which, I'm not sure uh, what you think about her, or as uh, Beatriz Cojeda calls her, Honda. I know that's how they pronounce their R's uh, in Brazil, but I just got such a kick out of um, – that lead up to that fight when she, I mean, Honda, Honda, but whatever. I know that's how they say it, but what do you think about Ronda Rousey? Uh, well, it's, I mean, it's apparent she's uh, on a whole different level from the rest of the girls. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, she's obviously pretty outspoken also, but I think we're coming to find out that, you know, she's cleaned out that, that entire division. She's, you know, she's an Olympic level athlete that she is. Right. She's, her reaction times, everything else, her power, um, everything's spot on. She's she's a blast to watch, and you know, I kind of like the way she's outspoken. To be yeah, honest abso with you. absolutely, absolutely. She's uh, she's definitely got some character there. Like, and so I mean, speaking to that, and I was just going to use those same uh, kind of phrases, like the explosiveness, her power, her. I mean, she's been training since you know she was so small. Like you said, she's cleaned up the division in literally you know seconds. You know, I mean, it's just so this next opponent, Holly Holm, I. It was originally supposed to be Misha Tate, and I guess that got scrapped, and I'm not sure the reason exactly why, but it seemed like more of a, more of a threat. I know she's beat her once or twice, but uh, I don't know. What do you think about this next opponent, Holly Holm? What chance do you think she has? I've called um, a few of Holly's fights, and, and she is, she's a superb athlete, the best, most decorated female boxer, you know, uh, by far. I mean, nobody even comes close. She's, right. I think, one... 16, 15, or 16 world titles legitimately. So she's certainly the best female striker. Yeah, she definitely got in hands. the sport. Yeah, but you know she, she's trained with Winkle John and and uh, Greg Jackson for many many years. I think since she was probably about 16 years old. So she understands the kickboxing game. Also, she was a kickboxer before she was a boxer, and and she does understand the ground game at at the level Rousey understands it. No, right, but right. but uh, but she does, and and. You know, she, she hasn't knocked anybody out of late, which she's going to have to, you know, she's going to have to do that to Rousey yeah. uh, to survive because Rousey, once Rousey takes an arm, she has so many ways to transition to new arm locks when somebody's hitting an escape that they just never find their way out of it hardly ever. So, you know, well, that's, that's all I'd be drilling. Yeah, and that's even if it gets to the ground. I mean, like, I think home, like her chance is, a you know, with her reach, um, and and her her stand up skills is is you know their best chance is to kind of keep her at bay. But I mean Rhonda, her whole thing is getting inside and, and getting that clinch to grab you to to give you your frequent flyer miles. If you know what I mean, you know I don't. I yeah. Don't, yeah. I don't see uh, I don't see Holly having enough. And I know Joe Rogan's even said like this is this is just a bad matchup. And you know in my kind of conspiratorial mind, I'm thinking they're just feeding her kind of this. I guess there's no such thing as an easy fight, but they're kind of feeding this easier fight to her before she goes off and shoots a movie. I don't know. I, that could be completely off base, but 
Um, I'm, I'm not a huge fan. Well, of I don't think I don't think that there's you know you, you got to look at it. There's nobody in our division that can right. that can do anything to her. So it's you know Holly Holm is a marketable fight. It's Holly's third fight under contract, her third and final fight on this contract, and she's undefeated. So, correct? in the UFC, yes. And but 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 this is but this is the third fight on a contract, and I know the third fight you're always paid a lot more, and I know she's being paid well because she was used to boxing money. Right. The UFC had to cough up some money to get her. Sure. Um, so I'm sure the UFC said, you know what, we're paying her a lot of money. Do we want to put her against somebody that she's going to beat easily and out point, or do we want to get some money out of this and uh, get some miles out of her for the money we're throwing into her? And sure. that's, that's probably what it comes down to. Well, do you, do you see it going past 30 seconds, 40 seconds? What do you see? How do you see that playing out? Well, you know, I like Holly a lot, and, and uh, you know, I don't want to. Well, <laughs> I don't yeah. want to say anything necessarily okay. too. Well, the, too, the objective, uh, the objective journalist, it, but... the objective journalist hat that you have to put on sometimes. What would you, what would you kind of say if you had to be, you know? I don't mean to like cause any rift or anything, but you know, if you had to kind of, I, I, I'd say if I, if I was betting on the fight, I would bet on Rousey in the first round, like I, you know, right? I'm sure most people are. You think she'll retire undefeated? Well, you know, that's the crazy thing is, is um, you know, you see fighters come along that are so far ahead of everyone else. Yes. If she if she doesn't stay in the sport too long, yeah, she'll retire to, uh, undefeated. But if she – there's a lot of girls out there now um, who are training to beat Ronda Rousey. Absolutely. They see what Ronda Rousey sure. can do, and they see her style, and they're like, I want to be just like that. I want to be better. And they're, everybody – got a target on your back no matter how good you are. You know, somebody comes along eventually and knocks you off. So right. well, um, it's, it's... I'd, I'd like to see a great fight between uh, – between Holly and her, I'd like to see. Hell, I'd like to see Holly upset her. You know, well, you it, always, it, it you would always be cool. Want to see an upset, yeah. No, I've always kind of, yeah, I always kind of root for that Buster Douglas moment. But it's it, what you said that Holly's kind of before. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Rhonda's kind of ahead of her time. You know, me and my brother, whom you know, uh, Lance. What's up? Shout outs to my brother Lance Wilson. Uh, we we used to yeah. have heat and still have conversation on Roy Jones. He used to give Roy Jones, and he had so much heat on Roy Jones because he was fighting kind of towards that towards the kind of towards the end. You know, security guards and such, but he was so awesome. He was so dope. Yeah. And he knocked out Virgil Hill with a body shot. I mean, he was one of those cats, I think, ahead of his time that there was just nobody really to fight, so he kind of got fed, you know, tomato cans, for lack of a better term. Yeah, no, Roy Jones, I I still will go back on YouTube and watch his highlights. He just had just, a fight a couple uh, weeks and, ago. Yeah, nobody nobody could figure out and still can't figure out how he and Mayweather, um, how their game works so well. Obviously, they're super fast athletes. That mm -hmm. helps. But it's it's the footwork that they use, and it's also the style where their hands are at. When you put your hands, you know, a lot of guys fight a person like that, and they, they kind of freeze up and put their hands right next to their head, which makes it even worse for you um, because those guys put their hands out away from themselves, and they'll sure. spread their hands out, and they'll keep their hands up most of the time, and they're able to parry everything that comes down the middle and block everything that that loops with their forearms and just and just moving their feet and moving their head. Right. But what what people don't understand when I put my hands out closer to you, my hands are closer to your head than your hands are closer to mine. So even if you were faster than me, you're not because the distance from my fist to your face are shorter right. than where yours are. So I can always beat you to the punch, and people can never figure that. You know, they just can't figure it out. Right. And yeah. uh, that's that's just. You know, you want to be a fighter that can be a, a different fighter at any given moment in a fight, whether you want to be a brawler, a boxer, a counterfighter, whatever. And those guys are capable of doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, like, I think way ahead of their time and set the bar so high. It's just like people were just in chase mode for years until, obviously, you know, they slow down. Uh, another fight coming up. I know uh, you got some anticipation going on in the, in the Lawler camp. The uh, Lawler Condit fight was announced recently. Uh, I've always been a huge, obviously, Robbie, as I've told you, the man literally scares me. Like what he did at the end of that that Hendricks fight, walking him down. I I've told you, I was like, that was that was terrifying. But uh, <laughs> it, 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 him and Condit, like uh, Condit's a beast too, man. The natural born killer. His stand up is really, really something to behold as well. Obviously, that's something Robbie's gonna have to look out for. What do you What do you look for in that fight? Uh, what does Robbie have to look out for? And uh, what are some of the What are some of the things you're looking for when you, uh, that fight goes down? Well, I think Robbie's physically um, quite a bit stronger than, than uh, Carlos is. The dangers with Carlos, obviously, he's very good on the ground, um, slick, very flexible, long, lanky, which can give you some problems. 
Um, if Rob does hit takedowns, he needs to hit takedowns where he ends up in, in half guard or cross sides when, right when they hit and not mess with Carlos's guard. But standing up, you know, it's, it's kind of that, that problem that fighters run into in Muay Thai where if I'm fighting a guy that's super long and he's got good, he's got good boxing skills um, but real good kicks, and then when you get inside with them, they've got nasty elbows and, and knees. You know, that's Carlos Condit. So you, yeah. when you fight a guy like that, when you're on your feet, you have to figure out a way to cover the gap and get, you know, I don't want to be at the end of his punches. I want him to be at the end of mine. Right, yeah. But I've got to be able to stay in that sweet spot where Carlos's elbows aren't effective and his punches aren't effective. You know, I'm just right in that range where, oh, where my punches – or what, or what control the distance, you know, and so. That's threading a needle, Rob, man. Rob's just going to find that sweet spot and stay yeah. there. He's, he's, that's got to, yeah, it's got to be like threading a needle because he, that, his striking is so versatile, man, to be able to uh, really overcome that. I can't wait to see it, though. I think that's going to be a really, really strong fight. Um, of course, of, yeah. course I got, of course, I got Robbie. I mean, that guy, like I told you, man, it's <sighs> nightmares. I mean, the way Hendricks looked back at him, he was like, someone, please get him away from me. I was just, I was terrified, <laughs> man. I was terrified. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's, that's, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard. Sorry. It's, sorry, it's hard to. I I tried to explain to people when Robbie re-signed with the UFC and dropped the 170 from 185. I said people have no idea what's coming. <laughs> people were making fun of me on the internet, and I said people just do not understand how hard Robbie hits. From he'll punch you from two inches away. And you said, like you said once block, he gets a beat on you. You said once he. You told me one time once he gets a beat on you, it's like it's a wrap. You know, once he gets that kind of. Laser point zeroed in on you. Um, yeah, he, he, yeah well, he's gonna start. He's gonna start smashing stuff. I had a question on a, on a Facebook regarding uh, uh, Robbie. What, what do you feel? What was your thoughts going on? I mean, I was I was so stoked. Clearly, when he won the belt. I mean, just seeing you guys and being from being from Davenport in the Quad Cities and just you know just seeing you guys for so long. What was that feeling? I mean, I know it's it was surreal, I'm sure, but what was that like, man? Matt threw the belt on him. It was it was so cool. But what, after all of those years and the wars, all of you guys, what was that like? And you know, whatever, the, 2015, 2014, to still be on that level, what was that like? Oh, we were just happy for him because you know he came. You know, my old wrestling coach called me when when Robbie was, I think, 15 or 16, and said, "Hey, you know, this, we got this kid that." You know, he, he needs a little direction, um, and wondering if we could bring him over and he could train with you guys and maybe hang out with you when it's not wrestling a football season, and and uh, you know maybe you guys will rub off on him a little bit. And so we took him in, and and Wayne Hogason, who still corners him, who's a chiropractor, a guy that I wrestled with growing up, um, brought him over, and you know it, he we just took him in. He, he was our little brother, and and so hmm. you know there was a time where. It was after practice, and I, had, I, I at the time had the UFC belt. And Matt and and I and Rob were in the locker room. We were all sitting down, and, and Matt had gotten gotten the best of me that day. It was uh, wrestling day, and I he pretty much kicked my ass, and I, and I did not have a good day. And Matt looks at me, and he goes, he goes, you better keep looking over your shoulder, old man. He goes, because I'm coming for you. <laughs> and I, and I said, and Matt didn't realize that Robbie was sitting right behind him. And I said, yeah you might want to look over your shoulder. And Matt turned around and looked behind him, and there was 17-year-old Rob Waller, and he goes, yeah, I get exactly what you're saying. Right. <laughs> <laughs> big eat, or, yeah, yeah, big fish eats little fish. You know, when Robbie was 17, he was beating up world champions in the room. He was yeah. already, you know, guys, guys that were champs and, and soon to be champs were coming to our gym from all over the country, and Robbie was putting on all, all, all of them. And, uh, you know, he just turned into a different fighter in the cage. Um, he, he got berserk and, and lost control because he just wanted to get the fight over with. In the gym, what you're seeing now from Rob in the cage, that's how he was in the gym when he was 17. Really? Just at it? Like yeah. He just, he just, yeah, I can't just see him at the time. Take his time, people, move his head, get yeah. out of the way of stuff. You All know, that's, yeah. that's, he's always done that in the gym. But to see that still, I mean, to see, like, from a reflex standpoint, to see him still be able to do that, and, you know, the guy's the champ. I just, I had to talk to him, man, and, like, you know, again, he trained with you guys, so it's, like, obviously that had a lot to do with, you know, setting the bar really high. I mean, you guys all had the strap at some point, you know, you, Chance. Like, it's, it was just crazy, that militant fighting uh, fighting, um, fighting system. Um, on to uh, a little bit more on the UFC, if you don't mind. A little bit more on the middleweights. Yeah. Moving on to middleweights, the uh, Weidman-Rockhold matchup. Uh, I I think, uh, what do you think about the Weidman-Rockhold matchup? What were your thoughts on that? I think it's a great fight. I think it's a great fight. I think that, uh, you know, Luke, Luke's got that 
I think his his Achilles heel is is going to be, you know, the wrestling from Weidman. Um, you know, can Luke stop the takedowns? I don't think he can. Mm. Um, I like I like Luke a lot. Luke's a really really good fighter. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got great wrestling, you know, partners out there where he's at. But he didn't wrestle like you know his entire life. So that that's something that. Weidman's just a very, very strong wrestler. Sure. Um, ultimately, you know, hey, if, if Luke can come out and shut a couple takedowns down, Luke, Luke could very well outstrike Weidman, but everybody tells me that, you know, a lot like Waller, people just don't realize how powerful and how hard Weidman hits. Right. So, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, they say if, if he hits you solid, you're, you're pretty much going out. Sleepy time. So, you know. Yeah, that, yeah, that one yeah, arm, so. that one arm guillotine, uh, guillotine. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. On uh, that uh, Rockhold put on um, Bisping was was ridiculous. I don't know if you remember yeah, seeing that. Just, yeah. I was just like, "Whoa, this dude is <laughs> this dude's wanting a title shot." And uh, speaking of title shots in that division, what do you think? I've man, I've told my bro Lance, I've been a big, big fan of Jacare Souza for years, and uh, yeah, yeah. he was supposed to be fighting Weidman. I forget there was an announcement or something after. One of the cards recently where uh, Dana was saying, um, you know, Suze's people are all on, you know, all on the phone with me, blah blah blah, saying it was going to be him and Weidman. But uh, not too long after that, uh, Rockhold and Weidman were announced. What do you think about Souza? I think he's going to be the champ eventually. I mean, if they, what do you think about Jacare Souza? Um, God, he's when I look at him, he's, I mean, the perfect physical specimen for fighting, obviously. Sure. Um, you know. But I, you know, when I put on my business hat, my thinking cap, as a promoter, um, does the UFC want a guy who doesn't speak English as their champ? I think right, it, right, 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 right. I don't, I don't know, I don't know if he's as marketable as an Anderson Silva. You know, Anderson didn't speak a whole lot of English, but still, he he just was very marketable, very charismatic. Jacques sure. is not that guy. Kind of paint dry, um, paint drying a little bit. That's true. Yeah, it's, it takes the complete package to to make it, you know. And, well, and, and that, so, was, that brings me kind of to another question. I mean, I'm sorry if you had more to say about Sousa, but uh, kind of, you know, it seemed like for years it literally, I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe it was just my perception of it. It literally was the rankings of the fighters that got you title shots. But, you know, I'll, uh, I, I used to kind of have heat with it, but I'm kind of coming around to it, kind of what, you, what you're saying. You know, it's all about putting asses in the seat. Like Shell Sun and losing to losing to Anderson and then fighting Jones for the for the light heavyweight title. Like that was just Shale just talking his way into basically two title oh, yeah. shots. Which, you know, a lot of people had heat for that and they still do with kind of the McGregor effect, but I'm kind of as you just said, you know, it's not so much you can't just pull like a top you know, whatever, just anybody and just throw them in as for a title shot or whatever, but People are talking their way into into title shots, and these guys, I think, need to kind of up their game as far as, uh, like you said, the marketability aspect. Because I could see a Jacques Ray getting overlooked even more just because of that uh, that factor you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, he needs to be, you know, learning English. You know, guys need to, you know, if they're a really good fighter and they have the potential to be a world champ. I mean, if, if you're not good in front of a camera, go take acting classes. Do what right. you got to do. Um, you know, WWE guys do that stuff all the time. Absolutely. And and that's that's why The Rock and and Goldberg and all these guys can could sell sell out you know giant arenas because well they can they can build the soap opera. Right. So you're not you're not necessarily against people kind of Con, I don't know how you feel about Conor McGregor but you know that kind of basically you know being your like own. Sell tickets. <laughs> yeah. You know, exactly. Sell tickets and, exactly. and that's that's just the way it is and and look they. I remember being on a phone call, a conference call, with the head of CBS Finance. And he was, he's, he's, I think he's still the head of, of CBS Finance. You know, and he's overseeing a company that's, you know, $5 billion a year, right? This guy's, he's got, trust me, he's got a bit of an ego. Right, um, because he's the guy, he's the master over $5 billion. Um, pretty, I'm sure, a high, high pressure job. But during that conference call, he told me that, Kimbo Slice, and this is years ago when Kimbo was going to be on CBS, right? He sat there and told me and the other guys that were on the call that Kimbo Slice was their savior. He was their star, and he was going to um, just make everything great on CBS for Seth, MMA. Seth Petrocelli put and it into said, that. And I, and I said to him, I go, listen, I go, he's going to get beat. He's going to get beat fast, no matter what kind of cans you put in with him. He doesn't know how to fight. He's terrible and your balloon's going to go down. And he goes, 
I don't think I don't think you know what you're talking about. And I go, listen, <laughs> this is what I've done my entire life. Exactly. It's fine that you don't think I know what I'm talking about, but you're wasting your money. Okay. If you want me to find you a star, I'll find you a star or two. Okay. But but you're. This is what the problem is in sports is a guy like that who wears a suit who does finance is making the decisions on who their star is mm. and not listening to the people that actually know, you know what I mean? So sure. that's, that's, that's where you can make your mistakes with a Conor McGregor. Look, how many miles are they going to get out of him when he goes up against Aldo and potentially Aldo chews him up and spits him out in a round? I don't know. You think that's how that'll play out? That, uh, McGregor, uh, I, I, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think he beats, he doesn't beat Aldo at all. Um, I think that uh, his last fight against uh, Menendez, mm -hmm. Menendez, in with two months of training, a full yeah. camp, yeah, yeah, beats him. I think it was even less. You could than see that. he was he was he was he was manhandling him until he gasped. Right. Yep. You know, so you know it is what it is. Well, my man is not on the McGregor train, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> no, I'm just oh, I like him, but he's he's not he's just he's not going to beat. Uh, a, a top level wrestler who can strike who's in shape. He's all show and no go kind of more more style than substance. So I mean yeah that that is kind well, of his no, he's a, no I think he's got a lot of I think he's got a lot of talent also. Yeah, I think um, he's, he's got, just he's not, got some he's, skills. He's, he's just not gonna out wrestle those guys and if they're in shape and they can keep that pace up for five rounds, right. he's not gonna beat them. That's true. Yeah, that's 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 the same thing. I, I was thinking about that Mendez fight. It's like man, Mendez took that on short notice and still kinda got the best of him, so um, last UFC yeah. question: um, Fedor supposed return, and I think wanting a shot at Verdun. What are, you, what are your thoughts on Fedor coming back? You think he'll be back? Um, you know, I don't know. I, I you know, the, the negotiations didn't go well between um, his camp and and the UFC before. I don't know if they will go through at all. But um, you know, Fedor for ten years was undefeated. He was kind of every fighter. I don't care who you were. Looked at Fedor kind of like the. the the picture of perfection as a fighter. He was kind of like the unattainable goal because in MMA, if you're fighting truly tough people, you're not undefeated. And the only fight he lost, I think he got a headbutt cut or or it was a cut that happened somehow. Cut in pride. Uh, and they, yeah, and they had to stop the fight. And I'm almost positive it was from a head clash or something. Uh -huh. um, and, and that was the only loss he had had. So he, he was technically unbeaten uh, for 10 years. And... You know, I think when I saw him lose for the first time, I, I think all guys that had been in the sport for a long time, who were real fighters, kind of, you know, it's it, kind of like, yeah, we really didn't want to see that. You know what I mean? Uh, so was it was it I, one of those kind of like, you know, as we know about fighting and fighter, it's like the inevitability of it, or was it? I mean, I mean, I forget who we first lost to. I think it was Verdum first. Yeah, yeah, you know, well, he. Uh, and then he lost to Henderson and lost to Bigfoot, I think. Um, okay, yeah, it was that like, yeah, he did. Yep, yep, it was three in a row. You are correct, sir. Well, yeah, I'd like to yeah. see him come, so I'd love to see him come back. I, I mean, I think it's interesting because I remember years ago Dana White was talking trash, a lot of trash about uh, heavyweights that weren't in uh, UFC at the time. And one of those people being uh, Fabrizio Verdum and talking about how they couldn't cut it in the UFC. It's just so interesting years later uh, to see him as the heavyweight champion. So I mean, I yeah. guess it probably gives Fedor a thought, or you know, gives him a you know thought process of you know maybe maybe I got a shot, you know, this guy's you know still yeah. For Doom, for Doom, his striking now is so good. He's such a big guy, man. I don't I don't know if you've ever stood next to that guy, mm -mm. but he is a big dude, man. He looks bigger than with his numbers on paper. He looks twice that size when you're standing. And he's a cool guy. He and I talk uh, when I see him and stuff. Real real cool guy, fun to talk to. Yeah. But he's a big dude. Man. Yeah, I mean, even he's when he was standing big, next big to Kane, dude. he made Kane look small, and I was just like, man, that's, that's, like, that's hard to do because Kane's a big dude. Yeah, no, he's a, he's a monster, man. He's a monster. Well, check it out. Uh, we're a little bit done with the uh, mixed martial arts chat there onto a little bit more substantive issues of sorts. Um, speak to a little bit of your – you were talking um, or you've spoken before. I don't know if you've mentioned now about your training that you've done and the training you do for um, the military and police. Speak to that a little bit if you don't mind. Yeah, I've been doing it for, you know, almost 20 years, probably 20 years, to be honest with you. I have to think about it. Uh, a good friend of mine, Mark Hansen, who's a police officer, got me involved in it. He and I were training partners. I remember from day one. Mark Hansen. I'm sorry. I remember him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and Mark was a uh, world-ranked heavyweight at one time and just retired from the sport simply because there was a lot of pressure on him from the department uh, because the sport was controversial at the time. So he just sure. kind of stepped 
and and still continued training with me. He still trains a lot, but he um, yeah he got me started anyway. Um, did that for for quite a while on my own and with Mark, and then formed a partnership and and formed a company called Firehorse Combatives with a good friend of mine, Don Roberts, out of Chicago. And Don actually just moved down to my hometown in Iowa because he wants his boy to wrestle in my hometown of Bettner. And so, um, you know, we enjoy it a lot. You know, we focus on, you know, I don't teach police officers in the military unless they specifically ask for it, uh, the striking aspects. I teach them control um, and controlling the three H's because we don't get a lot of time and they don't get a lot of time to train. We get a three-day, three day, eight hours a day training with those guys. And, and they have to be able to be taught simple stuff um, because the budget just doesn't allow for them to train a lot. Um, we control, uh, focus on controlling the three H's, the head, the hands, and the hips. If I can, tr can control the head, the hands, and the hips in a street situation, generally I'm going to end up okay. Um, people don't pay attention to where people's hands are mm -hmm. in a fight, and that's, that's where people get themselves in a lot of trouble. That's how you know, officers lose their, their guns off their, off their belt, you know, their tasers, other things like that, and, and then everything goes really downhill pretty quick from there. So um, we have to teach them the fundamentals of how to control the human body and how to control themselves. Most people don't even know how to control their own body, Jeff. Um, if you can't control your own body, you're sure as hell not going to control somebody else's. Sure. Uh, so just the fundamentals of how you should correctly move in a fight and to be able to move athletically and be just functional. Um, is the most important thing, and, and then teaching someone, a person like that, how to control another body is a heck of a lot easier. But, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult if, if the person doesn't even know how to control their own body. Right. Yeah, that's true. Well, speaking to that, like that training and what you see today, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if we're just hearing more about these issues with, with, with uh, civilian, uh, basically the civilians and police, or it's been going on forever and the news is just hyping it up or whatever, but I, it seems like we're hearing more about these, these interactions with, with the police, as you know, I mean, and the, the social and the subsequent social unrest that it's causing. Um, what do you think, is, and it's not a matter of like generalizing any of these instances because I think each of these cases has to be kind of dissected individually as far as like what happened, but what do you think right. the role of uh, police training or lack thereof plays in some of these situations either escalating or de-escalating? Um, I, you can right. pull any, any kind of any of the scenarios, but what do you think that role of training plays in some of these situations? Just period happening the, the 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 individual instances happening, and then once it does kind of get out of control, that that training of of you know, like you said, controlling the situation, your body, their body, etc. Sorry if that's too much to answer there. No, that's that's fine. But it's it's you know, I in in almost all these situations, unless the police officer just completely acts in a, in a way that just makes no sense, um, the the folks that write the checks for the budgets for law enforcement are the ones that really are to blame. Um, police officers are not given, you know, take a, take, take a guess at how many hours a year generally will a police force be given for defensive tactics training? Jeez, I would have no idea. How many hours a year would you guess? On average, um, do police officers get to train? And this is without their guns. This is just hands-on situations how to get cuffs on people, how to get them down on the ground in prone position without 500? just... I don't know. Is that a... Four hours. What? Four hours a year is what police departments are given for defensive tactics training. That's an afternoon. Yeah. That's not even an afternoon. That's Right, right. And that's that's what, that that's what these officers are dealing with. That's a nation. That's nationwide. Yeah. So, what? so what you've got, you know, Jeff, there's a lot of pretty capable... Um, people walking our streets that are pretty rough people, right? Sure. There's some really tough, tough criminals out there. There's some, there's some bad dudes, okay, um, all over the country. And you've got police officers who, many of whom, what, fresh out of college, never been in a fight in their life, Jeff. Right, They don't even right. know what it's like to get punched in the face. Right. Now you, put a, you, you take them to uh, the academy, and you teach them a little bit of grappling, you teach them a little bit of boxing, and then you throw a vest on them, and you throw, a, and you teach them how to shoot a gun, and then you throw a gun on their hip. And they have to walk up to criminals, many of whom are going to be bigger, stronger, faster, um, more motivated than that police officer. Okay, mm -hmm. that police officer just wants to go home, 
and and get done with get done with their work, go home see their kids, their, their wife, whatever the situation is, right? Absolutely. That officer walks up to these people, and they're terrified. They're terrified because they don't have the training. They're terrified because the standards in 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 uh, law enforcement have have gone down. Let's be honest. And I'm a guy that when I see officers, the defensive tactics guys I get to work with. Um, Many of these people are, you know, these are not the guys that are going to go out and shoot people. These are the guys that are general, unless a gun's pulled on them or a knife, right? They're not going to need to. They're generally going to be able to control somebody, the guys that are the defensive tactics instructors. But the rest of the people that they have to teach, they'll get four hours in a year to work with them generally. And so, you know, people have to people have to sit back and think, um, that's you know, I, Jeff. I'm going to put a gun. On, I'm going to put a gun on your head, Jeff, and you're going to walk up to 20 cars in one day. You don't know what's in that car. You don't know who's in that car. You don't know anything about that person. Sure, you're going to run the plates, but you still don't know what's going on. Right. And you think of the stress levels that cops are under every day, and and it, you know it is what it is. Um, but uh, and I think also, you know, society as a, as a whole has gotten a lot worse. There's a lot less respect for authority. Um, people just don't care. And and it's not a not a good place we're in right now. I agree. I agree. It's definitely been a, a kind of a slow deterioration. Um, well, <clears throat> excuse me. What do you think about? We we've spoken about how these things, if they continue to kind of escalate, um, we we see the responses in St. Louis, in particular. We've had a couple states of emergency declared, and uh, a pretty serious if not a literal military presence from the National Guard, a military-looking presence from the police force. Um, as, as we've seen, uh, police forces have gotten a lot more strapped up across the country, and there's even been calls right. because of this social unrest to federalize the police force. Um, if you can, give, give me your thoughts on, on if you think that's a possible solution or, um, or your thoughts on kind of as we see the, the militarization of police is it warranted as you say it's the society is deteriorating is this something that's warranted is it overkill what are your thoughts well remember when obama was running for president in 2008 um he said that he wanted to create um an armed civilian force that was as well equipped and as well armed as our military you're seeing it happen you're seeing it happen with our law enforcement then um the media the media apparatus and the administration, the Department of Justice, making matters worse by, you know, say for instance, the media with uh, with Brown and Ferguson mm -hmm. being shot and killed by the officer there. You know, you're looking at a guy that was what was he six four six five two hundred eighty five pounds. Big dude. That's not that's not a that's not a boy. That's a man. That's a very very big strong guy, and. He got shot for going after the police officer's gun. Look, anybody goes after a police officer's gun. If you don't end up getting shot, you're damn lucky, okay? Um, and then the media shows Brown's friend raising his hand, saying, hands up, don't shoot, and you know, all this stuff. And then this starts to sweep across the country, and it was a false narrative. All the facts of the Department of Justice, even during their investigations, the coroner's reports, uh, three different coroners, independent bodies said, yeah, this, this officer was justified in what he did. The media, the media really never, never came on and just flat out said that, right? Right. The Department of Justice itself, you know, you're not going to see people in the government, in the administration apologizing for this. You're not going to see the media apologizing for it. They fan the flames on purpose because they'd like nothing more than to federalize the police departments uh, because then they can do what they want with them. And it's it's not far fetched to think that once that happens, we're not that far away from you know a replay of the brown shirts of Germany um, and sending them out to, to do whatever they want. Right. And, and it, it's not a good thing. We have to have uh, sheriffs. We have to have police chiefs that are independent in communities, in states that have nothing to do with the federal government, because ultimately those are the people that are going to have to protect us from the federal government. It's appearing so. I mean, that that statement that you made. I mean, it sounds. It's one might think that sounds like hyperbolic or, or dramatic, but no. I mean, what it seems to me what we're seeing with like police forces across the country. I mean, it seems like um, 
it's it seems like a lot of times bo oh, their bounds are overstepping and uh, they're overstepping their bounds oftentimes. And like you said, there needs to be a lot more uh, local control of some of these uh, some of these police forces. Um, right. Uh, speaking about uh, administrations, we have the presidential elections coming up. What are your thoughts on the upcoming elections? And um, what are your thoughts on particularly right now? I mean, obviously, we're a little ways away from the uh, actual election. First of all, what are your thoughts on uh, Trump and what he's got going on, Mr. Donald Trump? Well, you know, if Donald Trump were actually telling the truth, which he may be, I don't know. Um, you know, it wasn't how long ago was it that he supported Obamacare, was against the Second Amendment, and gave the Clintons millions of dollars? Right, <laughs> he, which he even know, admitted to, it, which is even funnier. <laughs> yeah, and it's I sit there and think to myself, okay, is this a play by the Clintons? Right. To help get her elected by him running interference for her? I have no clue what the hell was going on with this guy. Well, and that was kind um, of what I was going to that Clinton, what do you, what's going on with her? It seems like, for the lack of a better term, the Democratic uh, establishment, if you will, are they done with her? Is she too much of a liability because of, I don't, I mean, the email thing, I could really, I could give honestly a rat's ass about, man. The stuff about Benghazi is just way heavier, in my opinion. So uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she should be in prison. She should be in prison. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, it, it, and if she doesn't end up with charges against her um, for the email stuff, which it may, you know, I think that they already said flat out that in her top secret emails, it shouldn't have never should have never been on the server. Sure. Um, that she actually gave up um, our our um, ambassador's location in Benghazi. Um, on her emails, she talked about exactly where he was. Yeah, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, without, without, I mean, this is obviously, it would be another whole conversation to get in, because we're kind of running close, uh, short on time, but to get into what really went down in Benghazi, I mean, it's not my or Pat's theory. Just go check it out for yourself and see what was going on, yeah, yeah. the arms deal that was taking place, that were arms were going from Libya, basically to Syria and ISIL, ISIS, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, we anyway. wanted them. Yeah. But, you know, back to the presidential thing, you know, I, I support Rand Paul. I support Rand Paul because um, he's the guy that truly stands up for the Constitution. He's the guy that, you know, goes and visits places like Ferguson and, and other places where, where minorities are, are really having a tough time and says, you know, this is garbage. They're getting arrested and thrown in prison for marijuana charges. It's, it's just gotten out of control. And the government has created this by creating 50 million people who can't take care of themselves by – um, entitlements, and they're not entitlements. They're they're giveaways, right. and it it, it, bu it buys votes and loyalty, and it destroys entire communities. Um, people don't even know how to take care of themselves anymore, Jeff, and it's it's terrifying because when the financial system, we saw a lot of trouble with it this this week. Um, when the financial system finally falls apart for real, mm -hmm. um, what do, what do you do with 50 million people that can't take care of themselves? Yeah, that, that's good, good. yeah. You'll be seeing not a real, real social unrest there for sure. I, I agree. That's a that's a, obviously another another kind of whole conversation. Um, what what this what this uh, is it engineered? Whatever this financial collapse, which appears to be going on, this currency war, which seems to be happening with China and the United States. In, in these, are you seeing these explosions happening all of the time? Or not all of the time. The last this chemical plant and this, over in China. Yeah, and there was one in Russia too. I mean, it seems like there's some, and there was a, a military munition spot in Japan hit. Or exploded the other day. It seems like there's some, and again, I've, I'm always down for a good conspiracy. It seems like there is a covert war already taking place. Um, I don't know. You want to chime in on that at all? I mean, I don't. I don't put anything past it. You know, you and I have talked about Operation Gladio and the Stay Behind Armies of NATO during the Cold War and after post Cold War. And people can go on and check out, you know, and study that stuff Please and do, research folks. Please it, do. and it'll freak you out. It will absolutely freak you out. The documentaries on YouTube about it. You'll, and, you'll, you'll be traumatized. And then there's People another there's another guest that I'm trying to get on. Um, I, I won't say her name. I guess I could, but she's a former FBI whistleblower um, that was essentially fired after 9/11. And she has a series on what is called Gladio B on YouTube. And if you want to get brushed up on how basically Gladio version two is to kind of taking place now, go and check. Yeah. Uh, go and just uh, Google uh, or check out on YouTube Gladio B. Um, I don't want to keep you too much longer, Pat. I am—I uh, don't know if I'm going to necessarily use this last part. And if I'm going to—I have this little series. I'm, I'm going to have uh, the conspiracy triangle of doom. It's a three-question conspiracy triangle of doom. So it's just a simple: 
yes no <laughs> answer on some of is these this, questions. Is this where is this where your listeners can can gauge what kind of fruit loop your guests are? Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. well, <laughs> it kind of. It, it is a bit of a litmus test, but you don't have to expound on it. Just a yes or no answer is fine. Do you, sir? Okay. Do you, sir, believe in UFOs slash extraterrestrial intelligence? Uh, to not think that there's life in the vastness of space uh, would be ludicrous. Yes, I believe in, in uh, other other life forms. All right, sir. All right, sir. That's an affirm from Mr. Pat Militich. Second question, sir. Who do you believe is responsible if it's – well, yeah. Who or whom do you believe is responsible for the murder of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy? Uh, the same people that tried to kill Andrew Jackson, the global bankers. Ooh, ooh, folks, shots fired by Pat Militich. All right, all right. I'll go with you there, my friend. All right, final question, and then I will let you go, buddy. Do you believe the official story of the events of 9-11? I have not dug into that. I've seen some of the stuff on it, but, well, I tell you what, to believe that that was orchestrated for a reason by, by government officials is it's a pretty serious charge. I, I don't know if I'm willing to go there. I'm not. I'm not I, I can't be convinced on that one. Did they know something was going to happen around the country? Yeah, probably, but uh, I don't know if they knew what it was going to be. Okay, okay. That also, there's plenty of information online on, on both sides, plenty of documentaries. But if you want to, I, I agree, it is frightening to think if they were to do that. But a precedent has been right. set before as far as false flags. We do now know, declassified, that the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which got us into the Vietnam War where 50-plus thousand, 58,000 Americans died, however more, more at home through suicides, drug overdoses, however many millions of Vietnamese, that precipitating event, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, we now know never happened. I don't, right. I don't know if you right. know that. So yep. to yep. think that they would... Freaky stuff, buddy. Yeah. Freaky yeah. stuff. All right. Well, there's plenty of information on all of that, ladies and gentlemen. Pat, what? give us a little shout-out on any of your social media that you want us to uh, follow you on, sir. Oh, just follow me on uh, uh, at Pat Militich on Twitter, at Pat Militich. And, and uh, if they want, check out uh, firehorsecombatives.com. Okay. You guys heard that, ladies and gentlemen. It, sir, it has been my absolute pleasure. Thank you so very much for helping us kick off. It's me speaking to you with such a huge, huge bang, bro. I've been a fan. Continued success and blessings, my man. All the best to you, my friend. Hey, thank you, Jeff. I had a good time with you, buddy. All right, man. Talk soon, brother. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Pat Militich joining us for better part of an Well, about 40 minutes or so. Um, that was a very cool interview. Um, Check out him on uh, all of his social networking sites, like he said there. Thank you for listening to It's Me Speaking to You. Please spread the word and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And stay tuned for more conversations with a variety of guests on a variety of subjects.